Thank you, Danielle. Thank you also for inviting me to give this web uh, webinar. Um, so as Danielle mentioned, I'm going to be talking about using nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR for understanding groundwater resources. Um, and I've been looking at the attendee list and I see some familiar names out there. So um, some of this research, um, if you have seen my talks before, might be familiar. Some of it might be new. So hopefully everyone out there will see something new, though. Um, but so um, uh, NMR is one of those tools in geophysics that's sort of not as well, not as common um, uh, as other tools in geophysics. It's um, used a lot in reservoir characterization for petroleum research um, and for, for petroleum evaluation. Um, and there are two primary tools that are used for that. The, the first is a Schlumberger tool and the second is a Halliburton tool. And these tools are used for reservoir characterization because they're really good at yielding total porosity. You can get information about that free and bound fluid volume. So that allows you to try and understand how much extractable fluid there is. Um, you can get estimates of permeability and you can also get information about oil, gas, water volumes and oil viscosity. Um, so these parameters that they measure that you can measure with NMR for reservoir characterization are also really useful for um, aquifer evaluation and aquifer characterization. Um, but these tools that were used to be, or that are used in, in reservoir characterization are really big. The Schlumberger tool is 6.6 .6 inches in diameter. The Halliburton tool is 7.5 inches in diameter. So they couldn't initially be used for near surface measurements. So for the near surface, there are a few tools that have been developed more recently. Um, these consist of a surface NMR measurement, this is a surface-based, non-invasive, totally non-invasive system. Um, it consists of these large boxes that you see on the surface here and a large loop of wire that's laid way out in the, in the forest out here. Um, so these measurements can be made, as I mentioned, just from the surface. They measure about 100 meters depth. There's also a near-surface borehole tool. The near-surface borehole tool operates at a frequency from, from 200 to 500 kilohertz. And that frequency depends on the magnetic field generated by this tool itself. The diameters of these tools range from about 1.75 inches to a little under four inches, so they can be used in, in near surface boreholes. And then these measurements are also often characterized by laboratory NMR measurements. So laboratory NMR measurements allow us to understand the petrophysics behind NMR measurements and relate the NMR measurements to the hydrogeologic or um, petroleum characteristics of, of interest. But no matter what way we make these measurements, the, the signal that we get back is always the same. So the signal that we get back is this exponential decay, and it's characterized by a distribution of relaxation times and an initial signal magnitude. So these NMR parameters can be used to estimate the water content and porosity, and the water content and porosity are proportional to the initial signal magnitude. And then this relaxation time or distribution of relaxation times that we get back can be related to the pore size, the permeability, um, and also the pore size distribution, and in future work, hopefully the water retention curve as well. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be giving you an introduction to NMR theory, and that sort of goes along with the field example that I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about using NMR to estimate permeability and some of the work we've been doing there and the, um, the issues we have with estimating permeability in the near surface and for petroleum reservoirs. And then I'm gonna jump subjects totally and talk a little bit about a broader impact project that I work on. Um, I'm gonna be talking about a, a, a field experience that I run called GNOMES. So to jump into NMR theory. Um, so as I mentioned before, the NMR signal is characterized by this exponential decay. And the way the NMR measurement works is we stick a sample or a measurement in a static magnetic field the protons that are in that sample, they align with that static magnetic field. So we're, so they, um, we then send in a signal, a secondary pulse that's specifically tuned to excite the protons that are aligned with the static field, and we move them out of their alignment. When we release that pulse, they move back into alignment with the static field. And that 
movement back into alignment with the static field, that induces a current that we can measure. So the signal that we get back comes directly from protons in the subsurface. So it's a direct indication of the volume of water in the pore in a system where we have just water. That number of protons is proportional to this value M naught here, which is the initial signal magnitude. And it's characterized by this point here. And this is the primary way in which NMR measurements are used in the near surface is to get at that volume of water. It's very reliable. It's, um, and, it's, and it's a really useful measurement to be able to figure out how much water there is. So this is just an example of how that works. This is, I'm using A naught now to characterize the NMR signal. This is the same as M naught that I had in the previous slide. This is the water content. These samples are all um, either fully to partially saturated, but you can see there's a really great alignment between the water content that we have and the initial signal amplitude that we have. There's a couple samples that don't perfectly align and those samples are affected by iron within the sample itself. So that's what's causing them to be out of alignment here. And I'll talk a little bit about that later in the talk. So now I just wanna move on to um, a field example where we've used NMR to quantify water storage and water resources. So this field example comes from um, Zarite in Peru. And Zarite is an agrarian village that relies on water from the Ramanshuka watershed. And this watershed is at uh, 4,000 meters above sea level. Um, this, this project and the field work um, done for this project was far, part of a Geoscientists Without Borders project run by um, uh, Jasper Ocean and Margaret Langett of Humboldt State University. And the goals of the project were both to quantify water stored in the Ramashuka and also to help construct canals for the village of Zurite. Um, the field data was collected in 2018 and 2019, and we had a bunch of contributors, um, mostly students from Humboldt, um, Humboldt State University, um, but we've also had students involved from Temple University and from um, the University of Texas in Austin. Um, okay, so this is a picture of Zurite and the watershed that is above Zurite. And this is an aerial image of that, of that watershed as well. And so you can see in here, there's sort of different terrain across this, across this region. Um, this kind of grayish purplish area that you see over here, that's what's called the Puna grasslands. And the Puna grasslands are an important non-glaciated water source in Peru. And as the amount of glacial water um, is decreasing due to, due to climate change, the Puna grasslands are gonna become an even more important water source within Peru. Also within this region are these Bofidels. The Bofidels are these small peat bogs that are thought to play a large role in the dynamic water storage of this region. And we um, used geophysics at this site to try and delineate things like the depth to the bedrock in this region, the extent and depth of the Bofidelis. Um, and we made measurements using seismic refraction, electrical resistivity tomography, as well as borehole NMR. Okay, right, so this is just a close-up picture of those Bofidelis. And you can see, oops, you can see there the green region in here. There's different types of surface coverage. Um, there's sort of a, uh, a deeper peat is this darker, green region over here. And then up here is these Puna grasslands. You get a better image of this here. These grasslands look like these sort of taller grasses over here. The Bofidalis or the peelands are in the center here. And this is a picture of the NMR data being collected during this, um, during this field campaign. And here's just a quick overview of the NMR compared to the seismic refraction and the ERT from this section. The ERT was collected over this region. The NMR was collected in um, hand augered holes all along the seismic refraction survey. And what we see from the seismic refraction survey, which is in the center here, is that in this region, we get a pretty a good idea of the depth to depth of bedrock. But when we move closer to the Bofidelis, our signal is attenuated, so we don't get great information from the seismic refraction survey. From the ERT data, we were hoping to get a really good idea of where the depth of the Bofida is, but it turns out that there's a clay layer underneath the, underneath the peats that has a pretty similar resistivity to the peat itself. And so we couldn't distinguish those two layers. So we didn't get um, exceptional data from that. 
What we did see though, is from the NMR data, we see, so on the, sorry about the, the blurry overview image here, but um, we see that in, um, for example, in hole nine, when we're in the peelins, um, we get really high water content. So these are water contents that are close to 100. Below that, we see a big drop. And so we're into the clays when we get below that. And so what we can do with this NMR data is start using, um, start, start estimating the depth and extent of the Bofidalis region across this whole, um, across this part of the, of the seismic line. And I just want to point out that all of that data comes from this part of that seismic line and not across the whole thing. Um, so that's just an example of how we can use the water content estimates from NMR. One thing you'll notice from these figures is that in addition to the water content estimate that we have on the left side of the figure, we also get an estimate of the hydraulic conductivity on the right side of the figure. And so next I'm gonna just talk about some laboratory work that we have been doing um, to estimate uh, or to look at how NMR data can be used to estimate the hydraulic conductivity or the permeability. So everything that I've talked about so far focuses on this M naught value, right? This initial signal amplitude, which comes from this point here. This is the part of the NMR signal that's most robust. And so we, so we use it most often. The other part of the NMR signal though is pretty important and also gives us really good information. So the other part of the signal is this distribution of relaxation times, and it's what characterizes the rate of decay of the signal over here. Each of these relaxation time values within this distribution comes from the surface relaxivity, a geometric factor, and information about the pore radius. So we can use these T2 values to get information about the pore radius, we can also write this in terms of the surface area to volume ratio of the system, or we can write it in terms of a hydraulic length scale. And this hydraulic length scale is the length scale that's relevant for permeability. If we look at the NMR distribution as a whole, instead of just considering the single components, we get, an, we get a distribution. If we have a narrow distribution of pores, then that distribution is a narrow distribution. If we have a bimodal distribution of pores, so we have some small pores and some larger pores, then that distribution ends up being a bimodal distribution of pores or of, of relaxation times. We can characterize these distributions in different ways. One way that we characterize them is using the peak value, or we can use an average value to characterize them. And we can take either this average value or this peak value and then use it to get an estimate of the permeability. So I'll go back now to that caveat that I mentioned that caused sort of a, an error to come up in the estimates of the water content. And that's the presence of paramagnetic materials and in particular iron minerals. So iron minerals also affect the, the NMR response. So in the equation that related the relaxation time to the pore sizes, there was this other term, the surface relaxivity and that surface relaxivity is strongly affected by the presence of iron minerals. So, uh, um, so you can see here an example of a quartz sand, an example of a gertite quartz sand, and the gertite quartz sand, the relaxation is much faster than the relaxation of the, sand, of the quartz sand due to the presence of the gertite iron oxides. So you can imagine a situation where instead of having a bimodal distribution of pore sizes within the sample, we have a bimodal distribution of surface relaxivities. And that bimodal distribution may cause a change in the NMR relaxation time distribution that we would may interpret as a distribution of pore sizes, but actually has to do with the mineral content within the sample. So one of the questions that comes up a lot when we're doing research and trying to understand how this T2 value relates to the per permeability or the hydraulic conductivity is um, what is the effect of that surface relaxivity on the measurement? And how can we kind of develop methods for estimating permeability that, um, that don't rely on perfect estimates or, or even um, the, on perfect estimates of the surface relaxivity? So the questions we ask are how well do NMR measurements predict the hydraulic conductivity or permeability specifically for near surface equation materials? And can these estimates be improved? 
So the way in which we predict permeability or hydraulic conductivity, conductivity from NMR is based on geometric or geoelectric estimates of permeability. So one equation, the, a geometric equation, is the kozani karman equation, and that relies on the surface area, to, um, the surface area to volume ratio, and also the um, uh, the tortuosity as well as the porosity. So we know that we can get the porosity and the surface area to volume ratio from NMR. So this is a potential equation to use. The other one is a hydraulic length scale equation that relies on this hydraulic length scale as well as the formation factor. And so the formation factor gives us information about the tortuosity and it comes from an electrical measurement of, of a sample. Um, so if we relate, um, if we then look at how we estimate these values using, um, uh, using just the geometric factors, from mercury injection porosimetry measurements, we can get an estimate of that hydraulic length scale. So this is, gives an estimate of the poor throat side, the average poor throat size. And if we compare our model permeability to measured permeability, we get a really good relationship across here. So. Um, from these, we can see that the geometrically derived length scales are good predictors of permeability for sandstones. So all the measurements across here are all sandstones. We can look at the surface area and the mercury injection porosymmetry measurements as well. And we can see that we get relatively good estimates. There's some outliers here. It's not perfectly within one order of magnitude of an estimate. Um, and we get good estimates for mercury injection porosimetry as well. So that gives us um, an indication of how well NMR measurements are going to work to, um, to, to estimate the permeability. The problem with all these geometric factor and geoelectric estimates of permeability, though, is that these geometrically derived length scales from surface area analysis or from mercury injection porosimetry they're pretty good at predicting permeability, but we can't use them in the field. So they can't be used for an in situ measurement. And this is why we start to rely on things like, per, like NMR for these estimates of permeability. So again, going back to the kozani karman equation, we can start to see how the NMR parameters fit into this equation. We know that M0 is related to the porosity, so it can fit into this equation there. We know that T2ML gives an estimate of the surface area to volume ratio, so we can fit it into this equation there. We don't get an estimate for the tortuosity for this equation, but it turns out that um, by looking at a lot of different lab samples um, in, in the petroleum industry, they found out that this equation does a really good, does a pretty good job of fitting the, of estimating the, the permeability. And this was an equation that was number, that was developed by the Schlumberger Dole Research Center. The C value here is an empirical constant. So typically what's done is in a petroleum reservoir, a bunch of samples are taken from that. An estimate for C is taken for each lithological layer in that, in, that, um, in that reservoir. And a different equation for permeability is developed for each different type of rock within the reservoir. Usually in the near surface, we don't have the ability to go and collect a lot of samples and do a lot of lab analysis on the samples to develop all these different equations. So it would be useful to have one equation that does it for all of the different samples. So this is that same set of sandstones that I showed a little bit earlier. And this is that K, um, the permeability estimated from the kozani karman relationship compared to the permeability estimated or the measured permeability. And what we see is that it performs really well for a broad range of, of sandstones um, and a broad range of mineralogy. But again, it really needs calibration um, because this is strongly influenced by the, the surface relativity. We also know that it's only based on bulk properties and there's no information about tortuosity or anisotropy. And I just wanna point out, I see Andy Binley on this on the attendees here as well. Um, he provided all the sandstones for the sample and these results were published by a graduate student of mine, Gordon Osterman in 2016. So the questions we have are, can we use other, can we combine other geophysical measurements with this sample to constrain these, these um, permeability measurements? And one idea that we had um, was to um, combine this with the complex conductivity, which allows us to, may allow us to avoid some calibration and also may help us constrain the hydraulic conductivity or the permeability for month stones where we've had some trouble predicting permeability in the past. So the complex conductivity is another geophysical measurement. It is um, measured using spectral induced polarization, which is similar to electrical resistivity, but made over a range of frequencies um, 
and it is used to calculate the real and the imaginary components of the conductivity. So what we do is we apply a current and then we measured the voltage response from that current. And there's a phase lag in that voltage response, which is what, is what allows us to get at the imaginary and real components of this conductivity. So previous research has shown that the imaginary component of the, of the um, complex conductivity is related to the surface area or the surface area to volume ratio. So these were shown in multiple different papers. Um, we can also get an estimate of the formation factor from the complex conductivity by looking at um, the, the fluid composition or the, the fluid conductivity as well as the real component of the conductivity. Another paper has shown that um, the, tor the complex conductivity relaxation time, which is another parameter that we can pull out from um, the complex conductivity is related to the dominant pore size as well. So these are similar parameters to NMR. So it seems like we could combine these information to get at an estimate of permeability from um, by combining NMR measurements with the complex conductivity measurements. And these are um, just the pore size distributions or the pore throat size distributions determined from MICP, so mercury injection pore symmetry, for a range of those sandstones that I showed earlier compared to the complex conductivity as well as the NMR values. So you can see when we have large pores, we get a an NMR distribution that has long relaxation times and we get a complex conductivity spectra. So this is the quadrature or imaginary component of complex conductivity that has a corner point that is at, at um, low frequencies and that and low frequencies indicates large pores as well. Now, in some, so this works well in this Doddington sample here, but it doesn't work well in all the samples. So, for example, in the Sherwood sample, we see that the poor throat size is moved, is, has gotten smaller. The imaginary component of conductivity has moved towards the center, indicating the pores are smaller than the Doddington sample. But the NMR signal has moved much further to the left, so it's moved to much smaller relaxation times. And this is because in this sample, we're influenced by the um, uh, we're influenced by the presence of iron minerals. In the Pennsylvania blue sample, however, we see that the, the mercury injection pore symmetry measurement shows small pores, the NMR shows small pores, but the complex conductivity measurement here also would indicate that we have large pores in the sample. So this is an example where we have the NMR um, working a little better than the complex conductivity measurement. Now, just to go back, um, there's been a lot of work done to look at how to use complex conductivity to estimate permeability. And um, we and the estimates that are done with complex conductivity to get a permeability, they use sort of the same ideas as the NMR measurements use. So we use we can use the um, we can use complex conductivity parameters to get at um, the pore size. Um, the hydraulic length scale, we can use it to get at the surface area to volume ratio. And then we can use those same kind of equations that we had before to estimate the hydraulic or the permeability from those measurements, from these parameters. And this is another example of doing it, of doing that in a range of mudstones and sandstones. So this is the predicted K, and this is the measured K, and these were done. Um, and this is just using the complex conductivity parameters. And so we see we get pretty good data for sandstones and, and dolostones shown here. But for the mudstones that are down here, we don't get as good, um, as good a relationship. This is the modeled permeability from the complex conductivity data and the measured permeability for those sandstones that I showed a little bit earlier. And we can see, again, we do pretty well for some of them with larger permeabilities, but for the, sh the, the lower permeabilities, we struggle to, to perfectly predict the permeability. So this is the joint NMR complex conductivity permeability model that basically takes an estimate of the formation factor from this complex conductivity and sticks it in the kozamini karman equation that we used before. And one thing you'll see here is that we do get a pretty good relationship for these particular set of cores between the NMR estimate, NMRCC estimated permeability and the measured permeability. So what we're seeing is that through traditional estimates of our NMR, we can't universally apply them without calibrating for all lithologies and without understanding lithologies. 
So we get an, a slight, but um, not a huge improvement by joining the NMR and the complex conductivity measurements. But what we do get by joining these things, even though the, the actual errors associated with them aren't huge, is by using this type of approach, we don't need to calibrate our samples as much. So we get a better estimate of permeability that we can use more broadly um, than just using NMR itself. So just to summarize um, the, those pieces, um, we know that NMR does a great job of estimating water content. It's reliable and we can determine water content under a range of field conditions and we can get really good estimates of that. When we use NMR for estimating permeability, we get a pretty good prediction, but it requires a lot of calibration and a lot of understanding of the NMR petrophysics. Um, and we can improve that when we constrain it with other geophysical methods. Um, and other applications that we work on are trying to link the NMR relaxation times to parameters in the VEDO zone, such as the matrix potential. Um, so now I want to move on to something completely different. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a different project that I've been working on for the last couple of years, and I work pretty closely with Greg Mount and um, uh, Jordan Hayes on this project. Um, this uh, project is called um, NOMES, and NOMES stands for Geophysics of the Near Surface, an Outdoor Motivational Experience for Students. And the goal of this project is to use geophysics applied to the critical zone to try and introduce first and second year students to, um, to research in the geosciences and to try and recruit them and retain this diverse group in the geosciences. So for those of you who are not familiar with the critical zone, the critical zone is the boundary layer of earth where rock, rock, rock soil, water, air, and living organisms interact. And it, it runs from basically the top of the tree canopy until intact bedrock. And near surface geophysics is used a, a lot in the critical zone. And I, I see, again, some people in this talk who have done a lot of that work, including Andy Persekian and, and Brady and Brad, Brady Flincham and Brad Carr um, as well. So near surface geophysics is used in the critical zone to obtain information about the structure of the critical zone. So things like depth to bedrock, the soil depth and the depth of the regolith. Um, it's also used to attain information about water in, in the critical zone, including information about the water table, the flow of water through the critical zone, um, understanding groundwater surface water interactions and to get at things like fracture, fracture and matrix porosity. The methods that are used are electrical resistivity, um, seismic reflection and refraction, passive seismic, ground penetrating radar, electromagnetic methods, including EM and airborne EM, um, as well as nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. For this particular project and for the students we work with, we teach them about electrical resistivity, uh, we teach them about seismic refraction, um, and we teach them about ground penetrating radar. So the idea behind the whole project is that we take a series of undergrad students, so these are first and second year undergrad students from universities and two-year colleges. We take them out into the field, um, and, and for most of these students, they haven't declared a major yet. They, they know something about environmental science, but they don't really know that much. They may never have had a geology course. They, they, probably, they don't know a lot of the, the geology terms um, as well. So we take these sort of really new students out into the field and we teach them about geophysics um, and we teach them about the critical zone. And we hope that by giving them this two week field experiment experience that they'll retain enough interest in the geosciences to become geoscience majors. Um, and then from that, they'll move on to graduate studies and academia or industry or government. Um, and so by also taking these students who are kind of all at the same level in the geosciences, um, we're hoping that we build a sense of community along them and, and try to help them believe that they are part of a science community. So we're building the sense of belonging amongst these students and a, and a sense of like scientific um, community. The field program takes place at um, the Susquehanna Shale Hills CZO, which is um, run, we're run through Penn State and, and um, it's located in, in central Pennsylvania here. And we've worked at the Garner Run site within the CZO and at the Coal Farm site as well. This is an overview of the demographics um, of the participants and faculty in the site. So are there 
Um, three primary faculty, we, we um, have peer mentors run the program and there have been, there were four peer mentors in the first year and five peer mentors in the second year. Um, we have partnering faculty and experts um, in critical zone science. We, we get a lot of help from folks at Penn State, including Sue Brantley and, and Roman DiBiazzi. And we have about 17, 16 to 17 students who participate in the program every year. And we've run this program for two years now, um, 2018 and 2019. And we were hoping to have run it in 2020. We had selected everyone, but of course um, we had to cancel it at the last minute because of COVID. Um, so the activities that we do is we have a bunch of preparation that we do, and I'm going to go a little bit into detail about this, but um, we design and write a field manual that goes along with, with the whole program as well, and that is a lot, that that's a lot of the preparation component of this, um, of the program. We have primary activities that take place during the field experience, and then a lot of supporting activities that take place. Um, one thing we try to really focus on is career talk, so introducing students to different types of career in the geosciences. And we try to build a range of career talks into it, so not just field-specific careers, but we also we talk about um, careers in programming and geoscience careers in the lab as well. Um, we try to bring people in to talk about their career paths from industry, from academia, from um, and from government as well. We get people from environmental consulting to all kind of introduce themselves to these students. Um, and then following the program, we have students continue doing the research um, on the data that they collected during the field experience. Um, and some of those students go on to present their data at AGU. And then we try to also get them involved in geoscience societies. So this is um, just an overview of the pre-program activities, including the mentor training. So for the mentor, we've done um, a weekend field training trip or a day-long field training trip, depending on the year. Um, and we also do virtual training because the, the mentors have come from different institutions across, um, uh, across uh, Pennsylvania as well as New Jersey. Um, so the virtual training is done in four one and a half hour sessions and we uh, have the students introduce themselves. We talk a lot about expectations and policies associated with the program concerns. Um, because we're working with underrepresented minority students, we um, talk a lot about working with diverse groups and, and how to create positive and diverse team environments and, and creating positive mentoring relationships. We go over the GeoPaths curriculum, and then we also talk about assessment of the student learning. So the mentors themselves actually, def actually develop um, learning assessment rubrics for each of the different components that they teach. So the mentors then take the students out and they do these rotation activities with the students. And for each of the rotation activities, we have one mentor who teaches that activity. We have a surveying and mapping activity. And keep in mind, a lot of these students are very new to the geosciences, so they're not familiar with, with um, making maps or surveying or reading maps. And so that is a big component for what they learn through this program. Um, we have the students learn about seismic refraction. We have the students learn about ground penetrating radar as well as ele electrical resistivity tomography. Um, an important piece of the program is also um, having the students sort of reflect back on their own learning. And so every day and every activity, we talk a lot about this. Um, for each activity, they reflect on what they learned in the activity. And they also try to think about um, what are the broader impacts of this particular activity? So how does this fit into, how does this activity or this method fit into society at large beyond just the measurements that we're collecting in the field? We try to teach the students a lot about teamwork and effective teamwork. So um, when the students work in teams, they reflect back upon what worked well in that team, what roles could have been assigned differently and, and how we can improve upon the work that we're doing. Um, the students then give, once they're finished their rotation activities, they give research presentations. And so they present the result of their rotation activities. Once they're finished their rotation activities, we actually also get them to design a small student-led project. And so that student-led project, they pick what they're going to do, they pick what methods they're going to use, and they pick what questions they're going to ask. And they also, once they're finished that, they give that presentation. And in these talks, there are a fair number of scientists um, who are working in the CZ itself who listen to the students' presentations, ask them questions about how it fits in with the research that they might be doing. And so they get a lot of feedback from CZ scientists as well. 
Here's an example of some of the supporting activities that we do in addition to the career talks. Um, we do team building activities. So the students um, participate in a ropes course um, that, that is run through Penn State by a program called Vertical Adventures. Um, we do other supporting activities to help them build their scientific skills, including how to present scientific data, talking about careers in the geosciences as I mentioned. We give them a day off because it's also very important to let them have fun. I mean, not that geophysics isn't fun. Geophysics is fun. Um, give them the day off to um, let them let them just explore the region as a group. Um, and then we also introduce them to other geophysics methods that aren't part of the rotation. So a bunch of students were really curious about how NMR worked. So we went out and collected some NMR data in one of the in one of the um, boreholes. So we've done an assessment of this program to try to understand how well. Um, uh, how how um, how the student knowledge is changing as they participate in this program. So this is um, changes in the self-reported geoscience knowledge from the students. And so their self-reported geoscience knowledge really increases over this programming. As you can imagine, these students come in with like no understanding of geophysics. And so we teach them about geophysics. And so once we're finished teaching them, the change in that knowledge is is really large. They um, they learn a lot about the geophysics and about the, the geosciences through this program. We also ask them about changes in self-reported professional skills. So we ask them to think about how the program has affected their ability to keep a lab notebook or document research procedures or to organize data in a spreadsheet. And we also see significant gains in, in these um, self-reported professional skills. So not only were we affecting their geoscience knowledge, but we're also helping them just with their STEM skills and professional skills in general. And then the final important piece that we assess is we look at the changes um, that these students experience in their psychosocial predictors of science persistence, persistence. So these things are factors that affect how students feel about science and whether or not that is going to is something that's going to help them be retained in a STEM field. So um, the important factors are science self-efficacy, science identity, science career expectations, and belongingness to a science community. And we see improvements in each of these different, in, in each of the different areas. And most of the improvements are significant or semi-significant. The one we don't really see significant changes in is science career expectations. And we're hoping to build upon what we've done in the past in the next year to, to help them further explore what their science career expectations are to improve upon um, this as well. You know, so we're hoping that by running this program, we're increasing these psychosocial predictors and that that will translate long term to student retention within the geosciences. Um, so this is just an example of one of the posters that a student presented at AGU this year. Um, she presented in the near surface geophysics critical zone um, section and she examined all the resistivity data and compared the resistivity data to some to to try to understand what the structure below solid flexion lobes within Gardner Run was. And here is a picture of the students who actually came to AGU. This was 2019. And this is a combination of the students who participated in the program, as well as the mentors who, who taught the students. So these um, three in the middle, Jack, Yanni, and Angel were the mentors. And then um, we have students, Alex, Aisha, um, uh, and I'm, I'm blanking, but <laughs> normally I would remember. Anyway, so just um, acknowledgements. Um, so a lot of the data that was collected for this talk was done by students and there's sort of too many students and collaborators for me to say all of their names, um, but there were a lot of people who contributed to the data in this project um, or in these three different projects. Um, the funding for these projects was, was um, provided by National Science Foundation as well as Department of Defense and Geoscientists Without Borders through SEG. And with that, um, are there any questions? Great. Thank you so much, Christina. And thank you too for highlighting the Geopaths work. And I know that you've been really great in helping us with IRS as we develop the careers module for workforce development, as well as Iguana introducing geophysics for near surface and urban applications. So thank you so much for all of your contributions. Um, 
Bill Harbert um, asks, um, there were some great online NMR resources available, including books that I think you showed really early on in your presentation. Um, he was curious about the manufacturer of the desktop um, megahertz system shown in an early slide. So I don't know if you could expound upon that. Um, yeah, so that system is actually made by um, Megatech. Um, and they are no longer making the system. They're no longer supporting development of that system. Um, I think they stopped supporting it a couple of years ago. I can't remember exactly. But, um, yeah, so the, the other system is made by Oxford Instruments. Um, they have a two megahertz system that you can use for lab studies as well. And they are still making and supporting that system. There's also a laboratory system made by Vista Clara. Um, the Vista Clara system has a lower frequency range than the other um, than the other systems. So the Vista Clara one, I think, is like 275 or 400 um, kilohertz, whereas the um, Oxford Instruments and Megatech systems are two megahertz. Okay, great. He's responded that it was very helpful information, so thank you. <laughs> Um, currently, we don't have any additional questions. Please feel free to, oh, great. We just had one come in. See, this is the thing about like latency with the internet. Um, so this is by um, Booty Zhao. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing things, but um, hi, Christina. Thanks for the nice talk. I would like to ask about the resolution of near surface NMR tools. Would it be practical for getting data within 10 meters depth? Yeah, so, so hi, Booty, but the um, resolution for the, for the surface-based tool, it's, it's pretty coarse. So you can get information from the top 10 meters, but you're not going to get like detailed kind of centimeter level resolution. What you're going to get is, is a meter resolution and that, and that, that resolution decreases with depth. So very near the surface, you have probably a meter potentially half a meter resolution. And then as you go deeper, you get much coarser resolution. Great. Um, Andrew Binley asks, um, well, nice talk, Christina. Um, I'm interested in the GWB project. Given NMR is expensive and relatively rare, how are you translating the technique uh, to the folks in Peru. Um, I am assuming that you didn't donate an instrument, it says in parentheses. <laughs> um, hi, Andy. Um, so um, we have just, so we flew the instrument down there and obviously didn't donate it. Um, and the geophysics component of it, we're not, um, we're just using the data from that and giving it, giving sort of a, an overview model of the the hydrogeology in the system to the folks from Peru, the more um, substantial piece that we're actually working with the community of Zurite to do is to, to build the canals and help them kind of design the canals to irrigate the fields that are at the base of that watershed that we're working in. So the there's sort of more kind of science that's taking place at the um, at the watershed scale, uh, we, although we do have a lot of community involvement in that component, but um, that science is being used to inform how we work with the folks within Zarite to try and help them irrigate their, their fields that are there and also build the canals that are within that system. Great, thank you. Um, I didn't know you could do this, but I have a, there's an anonymous question. Um, have you used fiber optic systems in your research? Um, I, I I haven't used them at all, no. Yeah, I figured. Um, so a follow-up on the frequency issue in NMR, can you elaborate on how different frequencies affect the NMR measurement and its application? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So there, um, so I didn't get into a lot of detail about this in the talk, but the different frequencies um, have a pretty strong effect on things like the, the, the resolution and the signal to noise ratio. So the higher the frequency that you use, the, the higher the signal you get. So if you have a really high frequency, you can have tiny samples and get signal from those tiny samples. As you go to the frequency of say the, the field-based measurement or the surface-based measurement, which is um, at the the Earth's magnetic field, and it's closer to about 2,000 um, 
hertz or two, two kilohertz, though the, um, the signal that you need from that measurement is really high. So you have to make your measurement over really, really big volumes in order to get a high enough signal to get over the noise. So, so the frequency, I mean, it, it also affects the relaxation times, but the major thing that, is, that it affects is the signal to noise ratio that you're measuring. Mm, great, excellent. All right, well, during that time, there were no additional questions. So, um, um, of course, see, this is always the problem, Christina. Okay, so <laughs> That's right. Um, so this person asks how long the student course lasts to accomplish mm -hmm. all the goals in the course. It's a really quick program. It's two weeks. It's two weeks in, in a two week intensive. And it, it is, um, yeah, it's pretty full on during those two weeks. But I think, you know, the students come out of it really happy with the program and they're really, um, they usually have really positive things to say about that. I've tried to keep in touch with a lot of the students through the years and, and um, or in the three years, and um, a lot of them continue to really value their participation in that program. So if I could ask a follow-up question to myself from that, if they're doing a two-week intensive as part of the geopaths, I mean, how are you getting these students like headed to AGU and Right. Like so the AGU component is a later component. So we have students basically do research credits in, with their department. Um, we've had students from primarily Rutgers and from um, Dickinson College participate in the in the research that they do after. Um, so they spend the whole semester kind of doing the data analysis, sort of thinking about how it fits into the bigger CZ picture, talking with graduate students from Penn State and graduate students from, from Rutgers about um, the interpretation of their data, and then they prepare their posters to present at AGU. So we have, you know, there's the two-week intensive, and then there's some follow-up with that as well. Great. Thank you. Are you still running the Geopaths program? Um, we have one year of funding left. Um, we are trying to organize running it this year, um, but um, it's we're having a little bit of trouble because of COVID concerns as well, and we're not quite sure how to navigate that yet. Um, so I don't know, hopefully we'll have something in the summer of 2021, and then we've applied for additional funding to continue it for the next three years after that. Right, great. Because yeah, there was a question about if you provide housing and stipends to the students and how many students you accept per year. We do. Um, so we pay the students about the same as a regular REU program. So previously it was um, $500 a week um, for participating and then the mentors are paid more on top of that. Um, and then the dorms, they stay in the dorms at Penn State and all of that is covered dorms and, and food and transportation to and from the site. It's, it's all covered. I mean, I think a big component of getting students who don't know anything about the geosciences to, to participate is making sure that we're not taking away from time that they need to be spending in jobs or, or earning money to go to school from, from them. So we do think it's an important to, to pay them to participate. Great. Back to some geophysics questions. Um, is complex conductivity the only other geophysical parameter that can help constrain hydraulic permeability? Could complex dielectric permittivity also be of use? Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, the um, dielectric permittivity is primarily related to like the water that you have there and not to the, the poor properties of the material that you're looking at. So I don't think that you could use it for estimating the, the permeability. Mm. Um, okay. You can see these questions too, Christina, so I think it's great. Um, in the joint use of NMR and complex conductivity, you mentioned one advantage was no calibration was required. How does that work? Um, so the no calibration um, required was basically just by joining all the measurements together. We, we did end up, um, um, we got one universal calibration factor that worked across all the measurements rather than applying separate, you know, separate calibration factors to different um, lithologies. Great. And I think just one last question about geopaths. How do you select mentors? Are they all from uh, RUN, like Rutgers University of New York? Yeah, the, so the first year they were um, from all from Rutgers University. 
in Newark. And the second year, we actually um, pulled students who had previously been participants in the program um, to be mentors. And that worked really well. I mean, the students, you know, they were so excited to be there and they were excited to share what they had learned the previous year in the program. Um, and so the second year of the program, they came from Temple University, from Dickinson um, College, as well as from Rutgers University in Newark. Great, thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Our next webinar is going to be on February 25th, and it's in collaboration with the Distributed Acoustic Sensing Research Coordination Network. And the webinar is going to be provided by Fabian Walter on distributed acoustic sensing in the cryosphere. So um, Casey Adderhold will be running that. And so I look forward to seeing all of you in February. All right. Take care. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.